Hello there. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Hi there. How are you? I can hear you and you look great. Thank you so think, much. Greetings. I don't think we wanted to start the recording yet since we're still 20 minutes up to the... Uh... Excellent. Well, I think it's the top of the hour, Andrea. So why don't we get started? Hi everyone and welcome to Creating Order from Chaos, a roadmap for aligning ethics and compliance in ESG. It's a big title. and <laughs> We are fortunate enough today to have two people with you who have a little bit of experience in this area. I am Kim Yapchai and I am Chief ESG Officer at Tenneco. We're an automotive company, um, automotive supply company with 17 billion in revenue and 73,000 employees in over 30 countries. And I took this role about a year ago. Uh, gosh, it seems longer than that. Uh, but I've been an in-house counsel for almost 30 years now. And, and we'll share a little bit about our journeys. Andrea, do you wanna introduce yourself? Sure thing. Uh, really great to be here, um, especially with my friend, Kim. Uh, to share some of our thoughts and hear some of your thoughts about this uh, big, big topic. Uh, just heard from uh, Dell's sustainability officer, and it was a great way to, to sort of see a microcosm of what we're going to be talking about. Um, so my name is Andrea Bonin Blanc. Uh, I've also been in the professional space for over 30 years, first as a lawyer, then as a general counsel and a chief risk ethics compliance officer for a few companies. We'll talk about our journeys um, and the last 10 years, almost 10 years, I've had my own business called GEC Risk Advisory, where I provide strategic uh, governance, ethics, ESG, and cyber advice. And I work closely with a couple of my friends in the ethics space, like Jackie Brevard. And um, yeah, uh, really trying to help companies think about these things um, from the uh, strategic standpoint and really incorporating the whole ethics and compliance, the whole ESG discussion under governance, how boards, how management need to think about these things. So delighted to be here. Excellent. So you should see in the poll uh, section, a, a, a question which says, how much do you think ethics and compliance skills overlap with ESG on a scale of one to five? So one should be not very much at all. Five thinks, you know, there's a high degree of overlap. So go ahead and put your votes in now. Um, you know, to be honest with you, when uh, the Teneco CEO asked me to take on this position, I was thinking, he must be confused. He doesn't know what I do. I'm a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> um, and this chief ESG role is so new that they actually found it difficult to benchmark compensation. So it really is a new area. Um, and, and as we go throughout, I don't wanna give the answers, but as we go throughout today, you'll be able to tell whether or not you think there is some overlap here. And we do want this to be interactive. So please post your questions in the chat. I've been in a few sessions today already and the audience seems highly engaged. So please continue that as you're with us here today. All right. And then uh, hopefully we'll be able to see the, the poll results or someone can share it with us, uh, Chris or Hannah in the chat, that'd be great. Why don't we start off with a first question uh, just so we can understand how mature is your ESG program? And Andrea, I think you have a slide on that. Yeah, of course. Um, let's pull that up. And there should be a poll question on this as well. Uh, one again, will would be, hey, we're start just starting out. And uh, five would be very mature. Okay. Are you able to see this? Yes. I can see it. Great. Great. So, um, so I guess we'll wait to see uh, the chat results or should we get started with uh, talking about some of our background and, and the maturity sure. issues? There's been 22 votes so far and it's about three and a half stars. Excellent. So people think some overlap, some not. All right. Excellent. Great. And then on if if you haven't voted for the, the program maturity question yet, if you can go ahead and take that poll, these little circles here will help to guide you one, two, three, four, five from left to right. 
and let us know where you fall. I would say, um, I would yeah, say for Tenneco, we are probably in the five dot, but it feels like we're still at one sometimes. <laughs> I doubt it. I doubt it. Given the role that you're playing, uh, you're <laughs> definitely on the on the uh, right hand of the screen. Um, yeah. Well, the, it's the five. whole the old adage where you feel like you're trying to build the plane and fly it at the same time, right? I that all the time. That's a really great, uh, great uh, way to describe a lot of the work that we've done over the years. Um, so let's see, should we wait for the responses or should we get cracking with our journeys and then talk about the maturity issue? So the let's maturity question has come in at 15 votes and it's at two and a half stars. Okay. okay. And, and I think that is what most companies are at. The majority of companies have not started. Um, they're frankly at a one, not even started their ESG journey, especially if you're not a public company. Mm -hmm. I think there's only a very few handful of, of companies that are in the four or five, you know, been doing this for 10 years, which is way longer than Tenneco has been doing it. We've made a lot of progress just in the last four years, but there are companies who have been in this space for a long time. And Andrea, do you want to speak to your experience in that? Sure. So let's let's talk a little bit about, um, you know, how how did we get here? How did each of of Kim and I get to doing what we do, which is very ESG uh, focused? And um, I think this is probably true of anybody who's focusing on this now. We started our careers maybe as lawyers, maybe as accountants, maybe as uh, risk officers or risk uh, people. Um, and I started my career as a lawyer on Wall Street in the era when greed was good. Um, and I didn't really like that that much. <laughs> so I was very lucky to, uh, to be offered a role uh, in a startup of a much larger company. It was a uh, electric utility, PSENG in New Jersey. Um, and they were starting their international power uh, uh, development uh, activities uh, outside of the United States. And I had been doing a lot of project finance work and M&A. So I got the GC role when we were very small and we expanded tremendously, bought uh, and, and developed power plants all over the world uh, at breakneck speed. Over seven years, we went from zero assets to four billion in assets. And with that role, <laughs> with that role, I ended up doing things that I loved to do, which uh, had nothing to do with the law, so to speak. And it wasn't illegal, but it was it was basically uh, first thing. One of the first things I noticed was the, the danger of corruption. Uh, and this is in the mid 1990s. So I, I'm dating myself. The dangers of corruption. FCPA existed then, but not too many people were in, enforcing it. So I started looking at FCPA. Then I said, oh, we need a code of conduct. I had a wonderful CEO who said, go do, do this stuff. We want you to do this stuff. So I ended up building an ethics and compliance program, a code of conduct, FCPA. And then on top of that, all the risk, corporate responsibility um, and, um, and crisis management things that come with being uh, an electric power developer around the world in places all over Latin America, China, India, Eastern Europe. So lots of risk. And all of those things that I did, including by the way, environmental health and safety was part of my portfolio. All those things are ESG. So we didn't call it ESG back then. ESG was something invented by the United Nations. Kofi Annan, in 2003, they used the, they came up with ESG as a nomenclature. But it's, again, it's reflective of what we're seeing today, which is a lot of nomenclature problems, a lot of issues now suddenly moving in the ESG direction, but a lot of us have been doing this for decades. And so it's a question of kind of pulling it together. So that's been my, the arc of my, my career was being an executive in four different companies as a GC, but also chief ethics, risk, uh, corporate responsibility officer, and now sort of from the outside looking in. And um, it's amazing to see what's happened in the last few years. So that's kind of the arc of my, uh, of my uh, discovery or, or entrance into ESG, but it's been a long decades uh, journey. Uh, I'm sure you've had similar experiences, Kim. Yeah, I, I agree, Andrea. So I spent my entire career in-house. So I always felt like I've been in, um, in the compliance space, even though I wasn't in compliance role. Because as an in-house counsel, you're always trying to prevent bad things from happening, right? Uh, and in, in that 
uh, during that time, uh, I did some things related to this space, like I worked with the procurement group to develop a supplier code of conduct and to initiate audits and things like that. So um, fast forward to when I was hired at Tenneco, the CEO, when I sat down with him to share sort of my 90 day assessment, right, got the lay of the land, okay, sat down, here's what I think we need to do. He made it very clear to me that he wanted to have a world class program. And I shared with him, okay, that's great, that, you know, love it. This is part of the reason why I came here. I could tell that you wanted to build the culture that, that uh, I like to work in. And I shared with him, to reach that level, to be world-class, at that point, you're not just working within your four walls, within your own company, but you're, you are going beyond your four walls to help others, to impact your community and, and other things like that. And I said, Tenneco's over a hundred year old company. I think our biggest issue is we have never published a sustainability report. And at the time I was just sharing information with him thinking, okay, he'll, assign somebody to fill that gap while I work on the compliance stuff. But instead he looked at me and said, okay, go do that. And I walked back to my office going <laughs> a bit puzzled thinking, I don't remember that in the job description <laughs> and I'm not sure how I'm going to do this, but you know, I quickly realized as compliance programs, we, in my prior companies, and I'm sure many of you on the phone, you contribute to the ESG report because you're reporting on, on the good things that you're doing with the compliance program. So, you know, I knew how the process worked. I just wasn't used to leading it, but I called a few friends and a few consultants and put together a budget and went back to the CEO and said, great, I heard you. I think this is spot on that we need to do and here's what I'll need to do it. And he approved it. And then I went back to my desk and thought, darn, I should have asked for more. <laughs> <laughs> that's always that's always one of those uh, fleeting thoughts if we could have gotten more at the beginning, but still. Yes, free. exactly, exactly. Um, you know, so, what, what you were just saying just resonates so much with me because I was at four different companies over 18 years and it was the companies in which the leaders, meaning the CEO pretty much, board as well, um, really wanted this to happen, that it happened, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And even if you don't have, you know, first of all, I, I would say you might be surprised if nothing's going on, you might be surprised what might happen if you have a conversation like that, not marching in and saying, we must do this, but saying, hey, I noticed our, our competitors or our industry, or hey, we could be the leader in our industry if nobody else is doing that. And, and you don't have to do everything at once. It's a journey, just like you don't flip a switch and have a compliance program overnight, right? It's the same thing with ESG. It takes time and you, you don't go from, you know, being a newborn to an adult just in a week. Absolutely. And I, I think that analogy of, I, I really feel that in, in my own sort of career that ENC 20 years ago was a very early stage, very um, not common um, kind of a program. So those of us who were doing it back then were struggling, were benchmarking with each other, were borrowing and stealing from each other. Um, uh, you know, when when uh, Pat and Ernie and, and Steve were talking about the 100 years of, of ECI uh, this year, uh, it's, it's something that really resonates with me because the research piece was there before, but the actual association piece, the piece where we all came together to share best practices didn't start till the 1990s, um, which is when the US sentencing guidelines first came out with, with effective, you know, the seven elements and all that good stuff. And we were all struggling to put that together. And I think the same thing is happening now with a broader ESG uh, program sort of a surge, re, not resurgence, but surgeons, I guess, is, if, it's a, if that's a word. Um, yeah. So, yeah. And I, and I found the ESG to community to be very much like the, the ethics and compliance community. This just so supportive network that I can call up other people and say, I don't get this. <laughs> I'm not a scientist. I don't have a degree in environmental stuff. Can you please explain 
you know, whether it be what's scope one versus scope two versus scope three or some other portion. But, but again, I think people in compliance, we're used to having just this huge breadth, right? At everything that the company does to follow laws can be considered compliance. It varies between different companies. But we already live in a world that is hairy and scary, you know, to other people. And, and, and frankly, ESG just broadens their world even further. And, and I'm having so much fun because it is undefined at this point in time. And to your point, Andrea, I feel like we have the ability to influence it and build it and, you know, hopefully do it the right way versus look back and think, oh, what were we thinking? Absolutely. And, you know, this also carries over to um, how our management and boards approaching this issue. And I've been doing a ton of uh, sort of work at the board level where, to be very blunt, I mean, the people who are serving on boards are not ESG experts. <laughs> They're CEOs and CFOs. And so they are very behind on the, on the learning curve unless they have brought in board members who have uh, some savvy, right? And so um, it's been sort of a learning uh, bonanza for everybody, you know, for, for management, for the board, and then for all of us inside these companies who are doing sustainability, ethics, compliance, risk, and so on. So should we turn to our maturity uh, model again and uh, look yeah, at that? Let, yeah. yeah, I think we can look at that and go to the journey and the tsunami. Yeah, the journey and the tsunami. We're, we've got a lot of analogies having to do with stormy times, right? <laughs> um, yeah, so, so we showed this to you a moment ago and uh, asked you to sort of uh, rate yourself uh, where you think. And I think I heard two and a half was where people, of, you know, so somewhere in the middle, somewhere between, uh, you know, having some ESG awareness and having a concerted effort. Um, this is just a maturity model that I've used in the past to, to sort of give that big picture, especially to boards. Um, where there's no ESG awareness, which is basically you have nothing going on, uh, at least in awareness, you may actually have components uh, of the ESG program in place, um, but there's no strategic think about it. There's no uh, driving force that says, let's, you know, let's put this together and, and understand what we have. Um, the next level is some ESG awareness, some components, people are starting to talk. And that's uh, often where I find companies um, are in that place, boards are in that place. And it's either the board or management that instigates, you know, the, if you have the enlightened CEO, uh, they, they instigate, oh, let's put this, let's think about how this um, program looks because we have stakeholders, investors, others that are pushing and we need to sort of knit together what we have. And then it moves into the tactical piece where you are actually, uh, going proactively, uh, have a team in place, uh, cross-disciplinary, uh, you know, the people who own the different parts of this, working together to, to start having that tactical and strategic discussion. And then, uh, Kim, you're, you're, I think, somewhere in four or five, which is the concerted effort to do the ESG gap and materiality analysis and or concerted ongoing strategy. Maybe you want to talk to those points. Yeah. I think this is no different than, than building a strategy to improve your, your ethics and compliance program, right? You have to start out in the beginning and build the basics. And as I say, sometimes crawl before you even walk or try to run. And, and you know, for those of you who deal with audit committees, often the audit committee or the nominating and governance committee may be involved in that if you don't have a separate um, you know, specifically assigned committee for ESG. And so you're used to helping to educate people on issues that they may not be particularly familiar with or have deep knowledge of. So it's, it's about building a roadmap and, and bringing people along just as you do with ethics and compliance. Yeah, totally. And, um, and I think what this uh, picture leaves out is that this is actually uh, a, con a continuous improvement exercise. This is not yes. just uh, you start it and you end up at this glorious place where everything is perfect. Um, it's more right. like you get to a place where you understand your, your portfolio of ESG issues. Uh, and I like to talk about technology issues and privacy issues and cyber issues as well, because um, ESG doesn't always capture that in terms of how people look at it from an investor standpoint and so on. But 
there's a whole host of technology and, and other issues that we should be thinking about in conjunction with ESG as well as because there are intangible potential risks and potential opportunities. So um, this continues to be a cycle that the company needs to continue to improve on. And, and you're doing that, I'm sure. You're not gonna create this perfect program and walk away and, and fall asleep, right? Yeah. Agreed, agreed. And we're going to get to the topics in, in uh, just a minute. But in the meantime, I'd love for people to put into the chat, what topic do you hear the most about in your company or your industry? And we'll talk about that in just, in just a moment. Um, but even companies that have been issuing reports for 10 years or more do not feel like they're done. They do not feel like they've solved all the problems, right? And they've figured it all out. It's just like compliance. It's a very dynamic and evolving area. And, and to your point, I mean, this is a really rapidly changing world full of threats, risks, opportunities, and changing constantly. And so this cannot be a static exercise for that reason. And it uh, one of the, I think, best practices out there, and, and I'd be curious to hear what you're doing, uh, Kim, at your company, but is to really marry the ESG conversation with the enterprise risk management conversation. You know, it's not just about risks, but it is about risks in a big way. And I think that's a good way to, to get at it, so to speak. Yeah, let, let's hold that thought for just a moment. Why don't we touch the journey real quick? Yeah, let's and then do we that. can talk about that risk when we get to the topic slide. You got it. So really what we wanted to show you here is a, a chart and, and there's many others with much more detail, but this is kind of a, a, a decades long ESG journey chart that starts back in the 1980s when some of the socially responsible investing and triple bottom line and sustainable development issues and concepts started happening. And then moving forward into the late 90s, early 2000s, you have some of these uh, reporting initiatives that have become really important, uh, like the Global Reporting Initiative, the Carbon Disclosure Project, uh, Principles for Responsible Investment, different entities, different stakeholders uh, are, are offering these up. ESG came up in the early 2000s, as I mentioned before. And then in the last decade or so, we've had some of these much more notable developments like SASB, which has become one of the real um, cornerstones of, of self-reporting and self-analysis on ESG issues. And you also have the SDGs from the UN, the Sustainable Development Goals, which a lot of companies have used them to sort of use as a North Star in terms of what, which ones of the 17 SDGs are we going to focus on the most based on our business uh, footprint and strategy. And then of course, we have a bunch of different rating agencies and others that have come up through, through the last few years, lots of competition in this space. So I don't know if you wanted to highlight any others uh, in this particular chart. Uh, yeah. or yeah. I'll say, first of all, I encourage you to take a screenshot of this slide. I wish I would have had it in the beginning because ESG, as you can tell from the letters, is like alphabet soup. People throw around these acronyms all the time and you're like, oh my gosh, what does that stand for again? So whether it be CDP, SDGs, uh, SASB is a big one, uh, SASB, and we'll talk about that in just a minute a little bit more, but 100% agree. And I don't think it's done evolving. I think it's going to continue. To evolve. In fact, there's a lot of convergence now starting to happen in terms of the reporting and there are all the regulatory pressures that are coming, which are not on the screen at all. So there's a lot of stuff that's been happening in the last couple of years, really. Yeah. And the SEC's new guidelines for, you know, rules for reporting as well. So it's all still still changing. But Absolutely. that's the that leads right into the tsunami slide. The tsunami. Right. Right. So um, so we could have added a lot more stuff and I, I have a lot more stuff where this comes from. But I love this particular the one on the left, the ESG ecosystem, increasingly connected and data hungry. And data is one of the big issues, right? I mean, you're uh, facing it. And uh, Paige was talking about those issues uh, in, in her role at Dell earlier today. And really, each of these little boxes here with a ton of different brands shows you the different categories of ESG ecosystem that have been growing up, especially in the last few years credit rating agencies, scorecards, specialized data providers, disclosure standards, sustainability frameworks, uh, fund rating agencies, ESG consultants. And 
you know, just like with everything else, this is also, and this doesn't even include, I don't think, I don't think it's there, but the, the big four, for example, the accounting and uh, auditing firms, they, they are throwing tons of money into uh, what they expect to be a big assurance and, um, you know, a practice that's basically uh, about to explode. Um, so you have all this going on and you have the good, the bad, and the ugly in here. I mean, it's not, <laughs> this is not, you know, some of these are uh, probably not the, the most uh, uh, reliable or great uh, sort of services. And, and then there are some things that are really good. So it's, it's a bit of a mess. It's a bit of a wild west, right? Yeah, def definitely. But, you know, I think it also goes to show like this is something that's going to be very difficult to avoid going forward, right? Whether it's questions from your, your banks, if you, I've seen questions for, on bond placements, I've seen questions from our insurance agencies, our customers, obviously being in the automotive industry, our customers have very high expectations as well. So it's just coming from so many different, uh, you know, different, different directions. And, and someone said the other day, it is like playing whack-a-mole. You hit one issue and then two more pop up. <laughs> and, and not everybody agrees on what they want and, and what they don't want. So a lot of times uh, you have to decide what you're going to say no to or not right now to. Um, yeah. But that's a matter of prioritization, which again, we are very familiar with in compliance. So let's, right. let's take a look at the issues um, next. And yeah. uh, here, I wish we could see the chat because I'd love to, you know, I don't know if yeah. there's any way for us to see like what, <laughs> which one is uh, most common to people if there's any commonality in the and what issues they're hearing about it at their company or their, in their industry. But while we're waiting to see if we can get something from the chat, I'll just explain this chart real quick. Um, it's from Just Capital, which is a uh, nonprofit that basically looks only at US public companies, mm -hmm. but they do a very deep dive into their public records and everything else through the lens of five different stakeholder groups, and you see them on the lower uh, right here, workers, communities, shareholders, customers, and the environment, and they're color-coded. And they, they look at these issues at these companies, um, and it's about 990 companies that they look at and they analyze every year, and then they do a prior to a risk, not a risk, but a um, best to worst kind of uh, scaling of their disclosure on these topics. And they have these 19 issues. This is their 2021 analysis of their 19 issues through the lens of five different stakeholder groups. And you can see that orange is workers and it kind of dominates the upper half. Um, and then you have, uh, I think, shareholders come in high, but not often. Um, customers are kind of in the middle to, to the bottom and environment middle to bottom. So it's kind of an interesting, um, you know, array of issues and the top issues are mostly related to um, living wage and good jobs, um, worker health and safety, uh, good benefits, work-life ba balance and that sort of thing. Um, but, you know, there's something like prioritizes accountability to all stakeholders is number three, which is pretty high up there. Um, so I don't know if we're going to get any any live feedback uh, from the chat, but I don't know if you had further thoughts about this, um, Kim. Yeah, um, I think this chart does a great job of showing, again, how uh, ESG is like a 360 for the company, right? You're, you're not just focusing on regulators, which we are often, you know, looking at for compliance. But at the same time, with compliance, we look at our workers. That's part of building the culture, right? And 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 understanding that that we have built something that helps us be a stronger company, that helps to prevent loss or give us a competitive advantage. So that's again, I think, a similarity between ESG and compliance. Is this really is a way to make your company more sustainable? in terms of long lasting, profitable, strong, which we try to do in compliance as well. Yeah, and you know, uh, interestingly, if, if we look at um, number five on this particular slide, 
acts ethically at the leadership level. Uh, to me, that is sort of the be all end all of success or lack of success when it comes to ethics and compliance, but also ESG generally. Um, you know, those of you who know me know that I obsess about this idea of if you don't have the right leader, you're not going to get these things. I mean, it's just very clear. And the right leader means somebody who's willing to learn and expand their area of expertise from being a financial genius or, uh, uh, you know, a, a product and, and, and innovation genius to understanding how these other issues, the environmental, the social, the governance, the technological, affect their stakeholders and how the stakeholders, um, uh, you know, uh, have expectations of the company in these particular areas, uh, whether they're employees, customers, the regulator, and again, it always depends on the footprint of the company. But at the end of the day, um, if you don't have the leadership committed to um, supporting the program, uh, walking the talk, tone from the top, resources and budget, to your point earlier, Kim, you know, you wanted to ask for more, you could have asked for more, <laughs> um, but at least you, you had the attention and the support of, of your leader. And that's not always the case. I, you know, in 18 years that I was in four different companies, I saw the good, the bad, and the ugly when it came to leadership support, uh, and mainly on ethics and compliance issues, but also on other critical issues having to do with environment and, and diversity and things like that. So yeah. I like to think about it that way, uh, pretty much. I see something yeah. coming in here. Ah. Yeah, someone asked if the PowerPoint will be available. Sure, yeah. We're happy to share it. Excellent. Yeah, uh, right. so let's see. Um, another question is, what recommendations do you have for starting a business or organization with ESG and ENC as its foundation? Oh, that, that's an awesome place to start, right? Yeah. I, yeah. I think if you're just starting a business like that, you just, it's part of the culture. It's part of your DNA. You build it right into the strategy and everything else. Um, and, and so that, it makes it so much easier if you can start with what I'll call just a holistic mindset. Um, I think people get tripped up over what's E, what's S, what's G, but I think a lot of it is, is very um, intuitive for people in compliance. But um, do you want to talk a, lot, a, a little bit about E versus S versus G, Andrea? Of course. And, and I think the thing that people should remember always about this discussion is it's not this world of ESG out there. It's the E, the S, and the G issues that are relevant to your business footprint. Now, if you're a really big multinational, you're going to have a lot of those issues, depending on which kind of business you're in, sector you're in. Um, and again, I, I keep going back to Paige and Dell, but I, she was giving us a very good um, sort of learnings about how they look at these sustainability issues and their footprint and circular economy, et cetera, et cetera. And so it's really about focusing in on what are your environmental issues, what are your social issues, and what are your governance issues, and having that interdisciplinary team of people interested in helping and pulling it together. Because you're not going to, you know, if you're a professional services organization, you do not have the footprint of a Teneco, uh, which is an automotive, uh, you know, parts and, and so on. And you have a different footprint from someone who's a Walmart. Um, and so every single business, I don't care how small, medium or large you are, you have to filter it through the lens of your footprint, your strategy, your people, your assets, your geographical, uh, your supply chain and then pull it together in, in a sense that makes sense for you. And ethics and compliance are part of that tapestry that you need to put together. Yeah, it's just like there's no one way to do ethics and compliance, right? There's no one way to do ESG. Um, exactly. You know, E, again, environmental stuff, your emissions, your waste, think of it like that. S, social, that's where a lot of your worker um, items come in. Um, you know, are you contributing to charities, uh, inclusion and diversity, things like that? And then the G governance, that's where a lot of the ethics and compliance are, are, are in there. And just the structure of, of your ESG program. Is it reporting to some low level manager or is there board involvement? Do they care about it? 
for for those of you who are who are new to the area, um, I I put a pin in SASB SASB the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board because that is really interesting in the sense that they've done research um, from with investors to determine by industry what are the important topics within your industry. Now that's only one lens, it's only investors, but it's a really easy place for you to start if you're just beginning, right? You could sort of look like, okay, here's what my investors care about or other investors in this industry. What, what makes sense now for me, for my company? Exactly. And again, there are things that are common to every company. Uh, every company has to obey the laws and be in compliance with the regulations that apply to them with the FCPA, if you're doing business abroad, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, diversity issues, social justice issues, labor issues are pretty common. But then there are the very specific things. If you're a tech company that has a platform like a Facebook, Meta, et cetera, you have privacy issues writ large. One of your biggest issues is that um, everybody has cyber issues. And, you know, some people put cyber under S, other people put it under G. I like to think about it as a set of technology issues because there's so many different technology issues that are popping up. You know, AI ethics. I mean, are you creating your own software and algorithms? Uh, if so, are you doing it in an ethical way? Are you doing it in a diverse way? So again, everything has to be very customized, um, but there's a lot of lessons learned that we can learn from each other um, uh, in terms yeah. of how we build it, right? Yeah. And, and I think this um, is a good time to switch to our next slide, Andrea. Sure. So there's no one compliance person that can do everything for the entire organization and be an expert in all laws. And it, it's similar to sort of this develop, new developing role. What is the role of a, a chief sustainability officer or a, a chief ESG officer? So I, I think this chart is really interesting. It really is. Um, you know, I, I pulled this out of the FT. Um, it's about a, a year, or year and a half old, and I wouldn't be surprised if we had 21, it would be even higher. But this basically shows you from 2004 to 2020, um, how many uh, chief sustainability officer roles have been created um, and, um, you know, what companies had first appointed for the first time had appointed a chief sustainability officer. And we've gotten up to 31 in 2020. I bet you there's even more now. Um, and, you know, this actually uh, makes me think of a question that I want to ask you because I think it's a, it, it goes back to the nomenclature and the tsunami and all this other stuff, the Wild West. But, you know, we're, they're calling it the chief sustainability officer here. And this research is probably actually based on that particular title. But if you threw in chief ESG officer like yourself, and I know a couple of people who've been appointed that in recent times as well. Um, whether it's called ESG or sustainability, are there differences? Are we talking about the same thing? What do you think, Kim? Yeah, I, I think there it's it's a mixture. So just like a chief compliance officer can mean, or or even the ethics and compliance department can mean many different things in different companies, right? It could be just, well, I want you to launch some courses from time to time right, versus you're building a robust culture and you have a cross-functional committee to help you to do that. So just like when you interview for a compliance position, I think you need to understand how does, if you're interested in a role, how does a particular company define it? How do they see it? And then understand their openness, if, if you think it's too narrow, their openness to expanding it. Um, but if you go to the to the next slide, and, and again, there are so few chief ESG officers, it's difficult to benchmark compensation right now. But I've seen a lot of, of compliance people taking this role on. And I, and I think it's a fabulous way to expand and create more opportunity. I was able to get promoted from a vice president to a senior vice president, and I'm part of our executive leadership team now. So what you see here is similar to how my role is structured, where I report to the CEO, I'm part of the executive leadership team, but then there's a committee that is all providing input to help make this go. And, and to the, there was a question posted in the chat, how do you maintain work-life balance? It is by, <laughs> it is this, because it's not, it would be impossible for me to try to do this all um, on my own. 
but I look at this committee as a forum to highlight the good things that people are doing, which we really weren't advertising either within the company or outside of the company. So it gives people a forum uh, to highlight achievements and needs. And again, and, and then, you know, we, we build the, the roadmap to achieve it. Yeah, uh, you know, uh, I, you and I have had this conversation before, Kim, but I, I'd like to share it because, um, you know, we shared our backgrounds a little bit before. In my 18 years in four different companies as an executive, I was GC general counsel a couple of times, but then I gravitated more and more to what this role is. And, um, and then I wrote, I've written a couple of books and, and this, this is a eight year old book where I came up with this picture because it was based on something that I thought really made sense. And I had actually experienced personally in a couple of my companies where, you know, at the end of the day, because the CEO and, and the nature of the business um, uh, pushed us in this direction, I ended up being that person who, uh, for lack of a better title, we call chief integrity risk and reputation officer with some kind of a team, cross-disciplinary team that owns the risks and some of the different areas of the portfolio. Um, and that's what ENC and, and corporate responsibility, environmental health and safety, supply chain, enterprise risk management, et cetera. So this was based on a, a couple of things that I had seen in my own experience and a couple of friends who had worked in companies where they had done something similar, but it wasn't the, the norm. And so seeing this becoming not the norm, but becoming something real in several companies, including yours, Kim, um, is very exciting because I really believe that, you know, ethics and compliance belongs in this portfolio and has some very serious uh, contributions to make uh, to, to, to making this a, a successful program. And at the same time, people who are ethics and compliance pr practitioners, um, whether you're junior, you're mid-level or you're senior, um, this is a, a career path that can be a very interesting one for you to pursue if, you're, if, if you see that the company needs it, if you see there's a hole and that needs to be filled, uh, if you have uh, you know, a management team and a board that, that are alert and awake and want to do this, there's a great opportunity embedded in this, I think. Yeah, I 100% I agree. So if you're at a company that doesn't have a committee like this, bring the stakeholders together and, and chat and say, see what sort of interest there is or you know, poke around. Um, if your company already has a committee and you're not on it, see how you can get your toe in the water. I think it goes both ways. Many times you'll find that uh, the, if there have been reports issued in the past, it was handled out of either EHS or communications. And this was during a time where things weren't regulated. And as we all know, the SEC has issued new proposed rules and it's becoming more regulated. So the teams that have handled it in the past may, you know, be uncertain how to handle these new changes. And that's where you can step in. So there's a really good question here. I'm just gonna read it out loud. Um, we hear that some industries are being blacklisted by ESG investors, such as petrochemicals, defense, and similar. This may need government assistance to ensure the continued sustainability of these industries, which can also have a very strong ENC and ESG agenda. And this is a whole other aspect of this of this phenomenon, I guess, of ESG is is the the downsides, the the negative sort of um, the greenwashing, the the regulatory overhang, uh, investors coming in for good reasons or bad reasons, trying to change things. We we all remember the Exxon Engine Number no. One uh, shareholder activism last year that got got three Exxon veteran board members ousted and three new ones put in place. And that's becoming part of that whole shareholder activism piece. Um, that's one category. The greenwashing is another category. So do you have any thoughts about that, uh, Kim? Yeah. Yeah. Um, rather than government assistance, I think private equity is going to step in here. And, and in fact, uh, Tenneco just recently announced that we are uh, have a deal with Apollo Management Group. And, and so I think that there are differing opinions in, in automotive, how long will internal combustion engines be around? Will everything go battery electric? Uh, you know, whether it's on the road, off-road, commercial, marine, however it might be. 
and uh, private equity thinks there's more value in it and a longer uh, you know, tail to it than, than the stock market does right now. So I think that's a perfect example of we're going to see different things evolve. Nobody, nobody knows the future right now. We all know that we're in a period of transition and that we want to move to something better. But, you know, whether it'll be by 2040, 2050, longer than that, or if it'll be something that none of us can imagine right now. So I think it's really interesting the fact that that private equity is valuing that. Yeah, it is. And it's interesting also one of the developments that's slowly taking place in private equity um, when they have a portfolio of different companies is they're starting to bring in um, board members that have savvy in the ESG ethics compliance space, not in a big way, but in a smaller trickle kind of a way, which is something I've been advocating for over a decade. Um, but, you know, yes. I, uh, I guess you live long enough, you start seeing some of your dreams come true, perhaps. But <laughs> no, but that's another great reason that this is a really good career move to start getting involved in this space is as, as boards begin to understand better the value of having some, someone with ethics and compliance or ESG, you know, you can do both for them if you're in this space. Mm -hmm. So, and I recently just got accepted. There's a, there's a, 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 cheer, a nonprofit called Direct Women that develops women lawyers to be on public company boards. And it's a very competitive. And I was so honored that I was chosen for this year's cohort. Um, but I think that my profile had something to do with that. Yes, absolutely. I, I'm sure of that. Um, and I think, you know, we, we talked about this 10 years ago when I was still a chief ethics and compliance officer in the company, uh, that um, there should be SECOs on boards. Um, and, you know, the debate was, well, what else are they bringing to the table? Are they just narrow ethics and compliance uh, experts or are they people who think more broadly about business? And that's the real tension here, right? And, and I think uh, looking at people in the earlier stages of their career, junior and more mid-level people, this is a way for you to expand your horizons, really understand the business. Uh, one of the things I loved, again, from Paige's presentation uh, on Dell is how much she was, uh, she and her team were interacting with so many other parts of the business that they had no clue about before, and now they have right. to learn about it. And that creates, um, you know, a learning environment that makes you a more valuable professional who can then aspire to go into those higher level management roles and even become a board member at some point. Right. I, I agree. And, and, you know, here's another skill that from ethics and compliance we can leverage is that ability to motivate and inspire. Whenever we're doing something with ethics and compliance, I always talk about the fact that with our team, we're impacting someone else's people, someone else's process, right? Whatever it might be. So you have to learn how to motivate and inspire indirectly versus, you know, just issuing an order to your team if, if that's uh, how you normally work. So being able to understand how to navigate your organization, right? Who are the, the influencers? Who can you tap into? Who are going to be the challenges or the roadblocks, frankly, as well? Being able to do that and, and um, create the momentum that's needed to change the culture, to uh, move the needle and make a difference. We do that in compliance already. And we it's do that really already. the same in ESG. I agree. And, you know, I, I'll use one example from my from my uh, corporate career. Um, I ended up having four different bosses over a six year period. And um, let me put it this way. It went from the really good to the really bad, to the OK, to the best. And so I went through that cycle of having uh, you know, different kinds of bosses. I could do like a, a, a business case just about that. Um, but I, I don't want to talk about you know, uh, things that happened in, in one of my companies. But the point being that um, depending on where that leader was, um, I ended up being able to either do my job well uh, really struggle hard to do my job or do my job to the best of its abilities. And, um, and I think that goes back again to a couple of thoughts that we've had uh, in, in the chat, as well as what we've shared with each other, which is this um, empathetic leader who understands that these things have to be part um, that, you know, being ethical, being motivational, uh, wanting to have the, the, 
ethics and compliance piece as part of your DNA and culture um, and thinking about the stakeholders that way as well is actually a way to create real value, you know, create a sustainable, uh, valuable situation. And so, you know, I, uh, there's a question here. Uh, is CSR evolving to ESG or <laughs> so we, we could tackle that one next if you like, but um, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think it goes back to the alphabet soup comments <laughs> that we've made already, which is there's a lot of stuff. At, CSR is what we called corporate responsibility for many years, then it moved from corporate social responsibility to corporate responsibility, sustainability, uh, and now ESG. So it's different incarnations of what I think to be more or less the same set of issues, which are, you know, a little different for each company. And so if you have a chief CSR officer, it's probably a bit of an old nomenclature at this point. So you might want to consider uh, sustainability. You might want to consider ESG, but it doesn't really matter as long as what you're doing is effective. You have the right program, budget, resources, people, um, and, and activities, right? Yeah, I see sometimes too, uh sometimes when people use CSR, they're really only talking about their philanthropy programs. Yes. yes. Right. Just if they have a foundation or some sort of corporate giving program. Um, it, but again, the, everyone does it differently and calls it differently. And, and so I don't think you should memorize it just as one way. You just have to ask if someone says, I'm a this, you say, oh, what does that include? What's your scope? Exactly. You know, going back to that maturity model, um, almost no ESG could mean you still you have a foundation, a philanthropic foundation, but you don't have any of the other things going on. So even if you have a, a philanthropic activity, it doesn't mean you have an ESG program or a fully fledged, you know, uh, sustainability program. It, it, so everything yeah, really depends on the details, right? You've got a person for your committee, though. <laughs> right. Right. So. Exactly. exactly exactly yeah so, there's, so a, there's another good question here what uh, this is uh what are your early assessment of the impact of the sec proposed climate rule on your program kim and andrea for industry in general so go ahead please kim yeah for for us it's not going to be a very big difference um, again we're a little bit ahead of, of where some other companies are so we were anticipating and you know call us lucky or smart, I don't know which, but we were pretty much on trend. And so, you know, if, we, if it moves forward as it is, we're going to not have to change much. I think for other companies, it's going to be a huge change um, for, for companies who have not been gathering the data simply that's needed for your, your energy emissions, energy use. If you haven't done it before, it takes a while. There isn't just a push of a button system for most people. It's all in little pockets and corners hidden throughout the company. Um, so, you know, it, it's gonna take a while for companies to transform. And that's my biggest concern is whether or not the SEC will adopt a reasonable timeline for companies to determine how to, how to do this. Yeah, you know, just commenting generally. Um, so we're still in the proposal stage. A lot of people coming in and commenting uh, and there's a lot of polarization also taking place in the marketplace between those who don't think it's necessary and those who do, and it's kind of divided political lines pretty much. Um, something will come out of this, uh, and based on what they've done in terms of the proposal, they really thought this through. It's 550 pages of, of great detail, uh, and people have commented very favorably in the sense that this is a well thought through proposal, so let's see what happens. And I remember uh, Paige uh, mentioned earlier that her real challenge is how fast do you do your public um, you know, reporting? Right now, they, you know, any given company has six months to get its act together and, and produce a report. But with SEC rules, you might have 60 days, 90 days, et cetera. So I think that's gonna be a big challenge. But I think the other big challenge is exactly what you just said, Kim. Um, if you haven't been doing some of this stuff already, uh, it's going to be a huge learning curve. And I will um, encourage uh, even privately held companies, and I've worked with a couple um, who, whose leadership decided this is important to us because we're in the supply chain, because we think it's competitive uh, from a competitive advantage. It's a good thing. 
And we also think that it's important to be environmentally conscious, socially conscious, et cetera. So start the, start the process now with a SASB self-assessment. You know, do something that allows you to start gathering the data and pulling it all together. Yeah, I, I think that's a great point. Start somewhere, anywhere, just pick right. something. And, and frankly, the, the EU and international rules that are developing are more aggressive than the SEC. So if you're a multinational company, yes. you really got to, you know, get a start on this. Got to get it, get it together. <laughs> exactly. Just get started. Again, nobody's perfected it. No one's finished, right? It's evolving. And I see um, somebody, I can't tell who, because they're copy, cutting, cutting and pasting yes, the comments yes. for us. Someone just said that they got the responsibility for ESG and is now searching for a vice president. So if anyone knows of a good candidate, I think reach out to that person. And, and they talked about how well it ties into their compliance yeah. roles and responsibilities. Uh, very exciting space. So really glad uh, glad to hear someone else is having a similar experience. And, and you know, the thing that this also, uh, this is such a great opportunity for ethics and compliance professionals. Um, you know, dare to dream, expand your mind, think about what you'd really like to be doing five to 10 years from now. And, and you know, this is just a great avenue. And just like cybersecurity has like uh, 3 million jobs around the world don't have people to fill them. Uh, we have a similar situation with ESG um, because it is exploding. And there are a lot of naysayers out there talking about ESG. Oh, what is this? Is this greenwashing? This is all, you know, a bunch of baloney. Um, it's not baloney because the investor community and other, the regulator community and even the employee and the younger generations are demanding this. So this is going to be with us. So rather than uh, throwing darts at it, you know, get involved and, and help shape it. Um, so I think it's a wonderful opportunity for ENC people. Let's hit our last slide, Andrew. We've got sure. about four minutes left here. So we've got talked it. about uh, uh, compliance people handling complex issues, being able to prioritize, navigate the enterprise, motivate and inspire. And I think this is our last uh, suggestion on how skills overlap. Go ahead. Yeah, so I, I love this slide. I've been using it a lot. <laughs> you know, I often say to people, you don't have to believe me. Here's McKinsey's research. Um, and, you know, so if you don't want to believe me, believe some of the power players out there who are putting together a lot of analysis. And this is basically um, a, a collection of 2000 studies uh, on the impact of ESG propositions on equity returns. And so the, the, the result of this, of this analysis was that paying attention to environmental, social, and governance concerns does not compromise returns, rather the opposite. So the share of positive findings from these 2000 studies on ESG is that 63% are positive and that 8% are negative. So um, ESG, uh, ethics and compliance, it's all part of the same ball of wax. And we're all trying to create a better world uh, through our companies and through our businesses. And um, there's just amazing opportunity here in a time of great turbulence. And, uh, you know, I offer that up <laughs> for consumption. Yeah, no, and I agree. And, and, and I think we're used to using in compliance our executive presence, right, to demonstrate the value that we're providing to the organization. And again, ESG is, is really, really no different. We create a plan, we manage the projects, and we get things done. So, um, and then you know how to report out to management on your, your KPIs and communicate uh, either internally or externally with a sensitivity to legal pitfalls. And that's the key because communications and EHS people may not have that sensitivity. So right. with that, let's put our last uh, poll up with two minutes left. Chris, it's already posted and ready for people to vote on it. Excellent. So we're going to check in again and see uh, if there's any difference between our, our first scores uh, as to whether people think that there's some overlap in the skills to drive ESG and compliance. I forgot what our first score was. Was it a three, Chris? Uh, I think it was a two and a half, wasn't it? Two and a half. Yeah, I think you're right. Two and a half, Andrea. Uh, yeah, I came in at three and a half at 30 votes. Oh, okay. Ooh. For the first one, maturity was at three stars. Okay. And uh, right now we've had two votes, 12 votes. Yeah, two votes on uh, the updated moving, moving the needle. Okay. With it. So if you, everybody goes to the, uh, the poll section of the, the meeting, 
you should see where you can enter in your vote. Well, we're, you know, maybe you guys already knew everything before we started. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we just tried to rev up the motors a little bit here. <laughs> exactly. No pun intended. Anybody. No pun intended. No, thank you for the automotive <laughs> reference. Of course, of course. Exactly. For those of you who weren't as familiar with the space, we hope we've given you a little bit of insight into the possibility and, and frankly shared our excitement for this space. We think it's incredible. We both, Andrea and I both love it. We invite you to join, dip your toe in the water in one way or the other um, and enjoy the ride, frankly. Another pun that's totally appropriate. <laughs> <laughs> So as you can tell, we, we had fun putting this together and we hope that you learned some things and we'll make sure you get the slides as well. Excellent. Chris, do we have a, a poll it, result it's yet? Still at, it's still at two. Um, okay. <laughs> but, it, but it's at okay. four and a half stars with those two votes. Oh, so. <laughs> oh okay. Maybe other but, people went out to lunch or something. <laughs> yeah, uh, and I think- For two people. Uh, we have the networking session coming up next, uh, but I think that's the end of the day of the official sessions. Let me look, double check the schedule. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, we have the, the networking session, and then there's also a special session for our members, uh, new members and first timers, and a special session for fellows and senior fellows. Excellent. Well, thank you, um, uh, Chris and team, and thank you, Andrea. Um, again, we really enjoyed having everyone join us today and enjoy the rest of the conference. Terrific to be here. Take care. Right. Take care. Thank you, everybody. I think they're still recording, but I just wanted to say thank you, Andrea. Likewise, Kim, it was a real delight collaborating with you. Until the next one. <laughs> exactly.